Nick, you work for something called the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. What exactly is that all about? That's correct. The best way to think of us is where computer science, psychology, and design intersect. We're hoping to build experiences, devices, and products that change behavior over time. We like to focus on positive and empowering behaviors. We have a peace innovation lab, a calming technology lab, and every year we have a mobile health conference helping people to create pro-social and positive behaviors. Now, are these behaviors where the person recognizes that their behavior is bad and they want to change it to be what you recommend for them? In terms of willingness to change behavior, we go across the spectrum. It's easiest to design for people who would like to change, and then we just provide a framework to give them that. But sometimes people are unaware. Sometimes, like in the case of an insurer and a population, will then help the insurer guide their population towards a certain method and mode of behavior. Well, what's the basic method of changing people's behavior? Do you just say, <laughs> well, here's how you want to behave. They say, gee, I never thought of that. What a great idea. The metaphor we like to use most is thinking of it like cooking, preparing a meal. There are a number of different dishes, a number of different courses, and you have to focus, what would you like? Is it an appetizer? And we think of that, which kind of behavior for how long? Are we changing one behavior for one day? A behavior over six weeks? At what length? And are we increasing or decreasing? Are we erasing or adding a behavior? That's how we compartmentalize. Could you give an example of a specific type of behavior that you try to change? And is it a question of eliminating behaviors or adding new behaviors or a mixture? When it's left to us, we would always add a new behavior, much harder to erase behaviors. So we like to layer on a new positive behavior. For instance, run half a mile once a week. That would be something that we would take on because we know that's a reasonable goal and an amount of time that we feel comfortable designing for that's realistic for a person who may not be running. Well, what if somebody wants to quit smoking, say, mm -hmm. would you have a method of dealing with that? Certainly. Um, or any kind of addiction? We have worked with a number of departments and firms that have hoped to erase addiction, but again there, we'd layer on positive behaviors that would divert attention and time away from the addiction. Now, you're the mobile team lead at the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab, so does that mean you're creating mobile apps that people can use on their smartphones? to okay. change their behavior? I'll give a brief overview of the lab. We have undergrads, graduate students, postdocs, visiting professors, and industry partners. So all of us have a myriad of skills. I bring together different skill sets, developers, designers, and uh, information engineers. And we'll team together or partner outside in industry and say, based on the methodology that we have learned within the lab, and take that and build apps that change behavior. So what would a typical app look like? Let's say um, I wanted to quit smoking, so I got this app. What would it do to get me to do that? <laughs> I'll give an idea of the apps that have come out of the lab, and that might be a better frame. Mm -hmm. We have had founders of Instagram, the recently purchased photo sharing app. Lark, you have a device on your wrist to track your sleep. Pulse, bring together a number of different news sites and feeds onto your um, device. For Info, one of the leading mobile advertisers, and the 500 Startups Incubator. They're, the hallmarks of them are simple, very few slides or screens, and a lot of personalization to the person. So as few clicks as possible, relevant to the user, and that embeds and creates a habit. Now, is there some kind of groundbreaking psychological insights behind this? Because I think the mobile technology is not the mm. critical thing. No. The technology is the easy part. The understanding of the behavior is the, the real critical part. And our stance that we take is it's different for each product, each user group, each time. So I've had instances where a certain directive, say saving money more often in a certain population, in my case with Spanish speakers, the same directive with the same group but a different geographic area, the, the same learnings didn't hold. So it's so many factors that are differing, each time we have to learn, which each new group of users. So you're not necessarily talking about uh, psychological disorders. You might be talking about bad habits, unhealthy habits that, yep. not compulsions, but habits that people could break if they really want to badly enough. And we're just creating the products that create those positive habits that get them and guide them down those new roads.
Okay. And so do you have your products out there? Are people actually using them today? Yeah. Um, Instagram, Lark, for info Pulse, 500 Startups creates and incubates products. And again, we have founders from those teams. We certainly don't take all the credit. They're very d driven, very intelligent individuals. But we like to think we've had an impact on their way of thinking and how they create their product. What would you say is the most important product that's come out of your lab so far? Hmm. Let's come back to that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, now, do you guys work together? Well, I know that you've had some professional association. Yeah. Do you like, does your work reinforce each other or do you cooperate in some way? Well, so far we've been looking for ways to collaborate. I think that, um, you know, I'm obviously firmly rooted in the tenets of cognitive behavioral theory, how to do behavior change with more sort of stuck behaviors and stuck disorders. Um, and certainly uh, Nick and his team have a lot more experience with uh, design, with gamification, and all of the things that make these apps um, sticky and really become a part of a person's life. And so we've really been hoping to find ways to meld those two because we have, uh, if nothing else, hundreds of thousands of veterans to serve in this country. So they are um, absolutely a, a group that's worthy of, of using all the incredible knowledge that's been found at Stanford. And how we think of that is we're certainly not specialists in cognitive behavioral therapy, but the behaviors that comprise that, we would take them apart. Is it telling the story and having that recounted to you? Is it seeing different images or colors? We would then design for those things that she has told us are important and then see our users doing this as often for as many times as we would like. If not, tweak the design, send it out again. Is it important to make the design kind of fun so <laughs> that people want to use it? Because I've seen some apps where you track your health and you enter different health parameters every day, but most people don't enter those parameters when they feel well. Yep. And then when they feel poorly, they don't have the history. So how do you get people to keep doing it? The goal there to make it as easy as possible. If the user does not have to input it and we're still able to gather the data, that's certainly our choice. Or to do it in a secondary way. For instance, encouraging them to walk and then tracking the steps taken in the route versus asking them, draw it in and let us know. So this would be sort of a health app, like a person wants to stay physically fit. But unless they have somebody nagging them, you know, they're not going to go out and do anything. So you have to have this app saying, why don't you run today? <laughs> Luckily, and the apps have nagging fun <laughs> functions now. <laughs> we build those into all of our apps for yeah. sure. <laughs> and there are a number of ways that we can think of that. For instance, we talk about a behavior chain. Is it waking up Sunday morning that gets you to run because it's sunny? Is it putting your bag near your bed? Is it wearing your running socks? Is it watching a certain piece of video content before? We don't know at what point, but we would test, hey, if I have my running shoes by the bed and I know the route, is that going to get me to go? We would test all those different hypotheses. Now, do these apps involve social networking or is it just you and the app? Because I know of some apps where there's actually other people at the other end. Like if you don't run, your friends will see it and they'll get after <laughs> you to run. That's certainly one of the components we utilize. Not always, but we'll see, is it worthwhile in this case? Do people, is it something that the people want? And then we would layer that on from there. It's certainly really powerful. There's nothing that, that I can do as a psychologist that's going to be as powerful as something that a veteran can say to another veteran in order to help inspire them to, to make whatever movement they need to, to get better. Now, do these apps replace one-on-one -on -one contact with a therapist? Uh, that's an or absolute no. Or is it just no. like, this is the best we can do? We can't get people to come in for therapy, but we can give them the app.